I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, an Amazon miss. Shares drop as the e-commerce giant's profit falls for the first time in two years. And this is as the company drops hundreds of millions of dollars to expand its free one-day delivery program. Plus, going it alone, Micron announces it will go ahead with the production of chips it previously produced with Intel. We hear from the CEO in a Bloomberg exclusive. And Twitter falls way short of third quarter revenue estimates. We find out why new user growth did not translate into ad sales. We hear from the CFO, Ned Siegel. But first to our top story. So Amazon shares plummeted in late trading after reporting third quarter earnings. So for the first time in over two years, the company reported a decline in quarterly profit. Most notable from the report, Amazon issued a weak forecast for the busy holiday quarter, likely sparking worries that its big investments in next one day delivery are not bringing the sales boost investors were hoping for. Amazon Web Sales uh, Services sales for the third quarter also fell short. So to break down all of these numbers, I'm joined by Jumpshot CEO Darren Baker and Jachendra Worrell of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you both for joining me. Jachendra, let me just start with you. Break down what happened to the bottom line. You're still turning a profit, but that growth was slower. Why? Well, actually, going to the quarter, there was a lot of angst around cost because we knew one day shipping would bring some variability in cost with it temporarily, albeit for a couple of quarters. Uh, and that variability sort of played out. Also, they are spending a lot on content, AWS, advertising division. So there is a spending cycle that's going on with a hint of variability here and there, which actually makes uh, next couple of quarters the anxiety would continue from a cost perspective. But where it is paying off, it's like you're clearly seeing a sales impact uh, happening on the retail side because of one day shipping. It will pay off longer term in terms of market share, in terms of revenue growth. But uh, as far as cost variability is concerned, you know, we think that will continue for a few quarters. Darren, are you concerned about the rate of spending, the right hand side of that income statement, all of those expenses and its impact on the bottom line? Or is this one quarter and we should brush it off? I don't think it's one quarter, but it doesn't concern me that much. I think what you've seen over the course of the last couple of years was Amazon kind of proved to the market that they could drive profitability and they you know, pulled unprofitable products off. They emphasized AWS and advertising. I think what you've seen in 2019 is that increased spending on the things that are going to drive more customers to use Amazon all over the place. One day shipping, getting those products no matter what they are back on the shelf. Uh, and so I think what you're going to see over time is their, their strategy is world domination. Anywhere you can buy a product, anywhere online, they want to offer that to you and they'll figure out how to monetize it in other ways, advertising AWS. And is market share, dominance, the right strategy, even though it's not translating down to the bottom line? I mean, they've they've proven that it does work. If mm -hmm. they if they want it to work, it will work. Uh, but at the same time, uh, with you know AWS specifically, if you look at the growth rate, there are concerns about growth slowing. You know, it's a it's a run rate of 36 billion. Uh, it, they are the market share leaders uh, in infrastructure as a service. So that. Uh, adjustment needs to be happening in terms of what the expectation should be for that revenue size, but that doesn't concern us. If you actually look at uh, advertising division, you know, you saw a growth acceleration this quarter, and, and what we feel happening is now advertising will slowly take the center stage as AWS plays more of a mature role. So we've talked about AWS. I'm showing a chart here in our terminal for our Bloomberg customers here showing the revenue growth for Amazon Web Services. Darren, how concerned are we that this is slowing and it is slowing multiple quarters in a row? Yeah, I think there is concern that it's slowing, but I still think there's a big market out there for them to continue to go after. And I believe that, that Microsoft is doing a good job and Google is investing heavily in web services, but I think Amazon's got a big leg up because of its deep customer relationships. And Jachindra, so he brought up Microsoft yesterday. I was speaking with the Jefferies analyst and he said, Microsoft of anyone in their Azure product 
will structurally benefit more from the shift to the cloud, even more so than Amazon? Are we beginning to see Amazon Web Services and there's some of their cloud products start to lose a little bit of that market share? I'm not sure about that uh, in terms of Amazon losing. Microsoft winning, yes. And that's the hybrid cloud strategy that they have been successfully uh, executing against and that should continue to benefit them. And you know, like you said, the, the end market here keeps growing at a healthy, healthy pace and there's enough room for three players. But Google has also stepped its game up uh, quite a bit uh, in the last uh, couple of quarters really and, and we're going to see those results. But at the same time, I think Amazon can hold their uh, growth over there in that 30% plus uh, range, but advertising, disclosure of advertising is going to become more and more critical. You know, this business can be significantly bigger than what it is right now. They have the opportunity, they have better targeting in many ways, because they are almost uh, just before the decision uh, is sort of placed. So they have a very good ROI potential. And as in this business gets bigger, they might pull the disclosure card. You know, you remember how AWS was disclosed in 2015 and suddenly the, uh, the profitability perspective for the company was changed. So now the weight is gonna shift more and more on advertising as AWS plays more of a uh, defensive and holding. So if that were true, why are we looking at a lower than forecast fourth quarter top line revenue if they have that advertising power muscle? I think they're probably looking at consumer spending and making sure that they are being conservative for what is usually a really big holiday season for them. But I do agree that when it comes to the areas of market share that they're growing and the investments that they're making in that, like shipping, and then their ability to just juice more revenue out of that same transaction through advertising, I think, I think they're, they're going to do, they have a lot more opportunity. And an interesting conversation that really does fold into the cloud is their hardware products. Things like Alexa, which should enable more shift as well and more revenue growth to the cloud. Do you see them continuing to integrate the hardware with the software? I do. I mean, a, a way to think about that online on their website is that still only about 12% of the product views that Amazon sees comes from a search that someone paid for. Um, you can imagine there's so much more opportunity to grow that online. And then once you start integrating voice and app and Whole Foods, I mean, they've made some really nice strategic plays here where they're going to own a much larger swath of that customer experience. Let's not forget there's a grocery business, there's the fresh business, there's a Whole Foods purchase. Have we learned anything again about the integration of the groceries? You, you know, the expectations for uh, that business remain single digits. They are performing in single digits. I think this is going to be a much longer play than uh, uh, what we initially thought, but it's reflected in the expectations. And the fourth quarter uh, revenue dip, they did mention concerns about international growth slowing down because of holiday shifts here and there. So that, that might uh, play a role. We'll you know, dig deeper into the call uh, to get the reasoning behind it. But if you look at this quarter, the fact that one day shipping is materially driving uh, acceleration in, in retail spending is telling you it even if it's so early, it is actually showing signs. So it really builds a moat around them as competition gears up, uh, you know, Walmart offering free two day shipping and, and everybody's trying to get to uh, one day as well. You know, Amazon will have already invested and, and sort of like had that lead, if you may, to protect their uh, turf. So Darren, final thoughts to you. If they do indeed have that moat, to protect against competition. I want to come and take a look at another chart here inside my Bloomberg terminal, which is on a normalized basis. Amazon share is going back a year, underperforming the broader retail index. Is it a regulatory overhang? What is it that we aren't seeing these shares drive higher given their dominance? Yeah, I think it is that that natural anti-reaction to world dominance, right? Whether it's labor strife or regulatory concerns, I think those are all things that are factoring into it where a lot of the underlying fundamentals long-term of that business are still extremely strong. Jumpshot CEO Darren Baker and Jachendra Worrall of Bloomberg Thanks. Intelligence, thank you both for joining. Now, shares of Microsoft rose Thursday. Fiscal first quarter results were better than expected, and they boosted analyst confidence. Jeffries wrote that Microsoft should be able to, quote, weather any storm. Microsoft is up 16% since June, trading near an all-time high. And coming up, keeping track, Google employees say the company is trying to keep them from speaking out and that it's using Google Chrome to do so. We have the details next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
Google, once famous for encouraging its employees to speak out against things that they thought were wrong, is now being accused of trying to crush worker dissent. Employees claim that the search giant has created a web browser enabled tool to monitor workers' attempts to organize protests and discuss labor rights. This comes amidst increasing confrontations between alphabet management and employees. So to discuss, I bring in Bloomberg's global executive editor for tech, Tom Giles. What are employees saying in this instance? Yeah, so there's a memo that's been circulated. We don't know how widely, but the concern is, the concern that's been raised is that this tool, it's a new extension for the Chrome browser that's used internally in the same way we use tools here to set up meetings, et cetera. This one sends up a red flag uh, or some kind of a flag when somebody organizes a meeting that occupies a certain number of rooms or involves a certain number of people. Once it reaches that threshold, I think it's 10 rooms, 100 people, it gets flagged. Now, Google has been, has come back and very, you know, said to us, look, the memo misinterprets this. This is something that we've put in place to cut down on meeting spam, misuse of space, things along those lines. I think all of us who work in, in places where there's a scarcity of, of, of office space or concerns about spam can identify with the concern about like, you know, is this stuff being allocated correctly? However, in the Google setting where there has been this escalation, as you pointed out, in tension between the employees and the management, over organization, over protests, over management decisions, and there's been walkouts that have involved thousands of people. The concern, the question is, is this an attempt to tamp down organizing, to kind of keep us from you know, raising protests. And to be fair, I want to bring up Google's statement in response, which said that the claims about the operation of this purpose are categorically false. It is a pop-up reminder that asks people to be mindful before auto-adding a meeting to the calendars of a large number of employees. So. Uh, what is the take from Google's perspective? Yeah, I mean, their, their sense is like, hey, look, this memo is misinterpreting the intent of this tool. Um, but what we have done as reporters is we're, you know, we've spoken to the, we've spoken to people who are familiar with the situation, um, who are familiar with the contents of the memo. They've done some research. There's engineers at Google um, who are very good at what they do. They have looked at the tools. They have done their own analysis of it, and they have raised some of those same concerns that were outlined in the memo. And like you said, there has been growing tension, if you right. will, between Google and their employees. Remind us again some of the recent heightened tensions that we have been feeling. Sure. Uh, so there was concerns about payouts for executive, uh, for a particular executive who walked away with a lot of money after being accused of misconduct, sexual misconduct uh, within Google. That was one of the things that raised a lot of concerns. Employees have also raised concerns about Google's willingness to go out and court government contracts, to use Google technology uh, for the military, for example. Um, you know, is there artificial intelligence? Is there facial recognition? Those kinds of technologies, are those going to be used for purposes that people within the rank and file disagree with? And not to diminish this, but is this perhaps maybe not a Google problem, but a broader Silicon Valley problem where there just has become increasing frustration between employees and management? Yeah, there's increasing willingness for uh, companies throughout the technology industry, Silicon Valley and beyond, to protest, to walk out, to raise questions about how our technology, is our technology being used for the right purposes, for to make the world a better place, or to make the world more violent, is it? And so these are these are valid questions, and we've seen a vol, uh, an increase in the and the uh, willingness and uh, frequency of employees raising these questions. Well, digging down and getting the scoop, it is Bloomberg's Tom Giles. Thank you for joining. And coming up, Micron's got a new chip that it says will make data storage centers faster than ever. We discuss with the CEO that is Sanjay Mirota. He's next. This is Bloomberg.
two U.S. senators are calling for the Chinese-owned viral video app TikTok to be investigated. Republican Senator Tom Cotton and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer say its growing popularity in the U.S. creates national security risks. The senators have also voiced concern that the Chinese government could make the company behind TikTok, that's ByteDance, turn over the data it collects. The app saw its appeal wane for the first time this quarter with data showing a 4% decline in user downloads year over year. Now, Micron today announced it's foraging ahead independently with a new memory technology. It's called 3D X-Point. It's a type of chip it previously produced with Intel. The new chips will form storage drives and data centers that will provide faster access to data that existing models do. It's currently sampling the chips to customers. And who better to tell us more than the Micron CEO that is Sanjay Merotra. So thank you so much for joining me. Talk to me about this new chip. Great to be here. Uh, 3D CrossPoint is a persistent memory. What we mean by that is that it is a kind of memory that is giving you fast, uh, faster speeds than NAND memory, than flash memory, and chip densities that are uh, higher than DRAM memory. It is really ideally suited for data center applications suited for both memory as well as storage. So this is to accelerate deep learning kind of workloads that require high speeds. What we introduced today is a solid state drive that is the fastest drive in the world that we introduced, so and very is, exciting. Is this really banking on the future of the cloud? It, it's, 3D crosspoint memory is a technology that works well in data center applications. Of course, it is a technology that can also be deployed to other end market applications such as mobile or other intelligent devices on the edge. But no doubt, data center is a big opportunity because the trends of artificial intelligence today are absolutely requiring uh, ability to process a lot of data, gain more insight from the data, unlock greater value. That means you have to be able to have memory and storage solutions, which is what Micron makes. We are the only company in the Western Hemisphere that makes semiconductor memory and storage solutions. You have to store data, you have to access it fast, you have to process it fast. It needs the kind of solutions Micron makes. And yes, they go not only in cloud applications, data center applications, but all the intelligent devices at the edge, from smartphones to automobiles. You know, you had previously been working with Intel on this. Why the move to go it alone? Well, we have a great opportunity here to control our own destiny. And with respect to technology and manufacturing capabilities, we had partnership and a joint venture before. Now we have opportunity to bring the technology to a broad set of applications and manage our technology roadmap, product roadmap, as well as manufacturing capabilities in line with our business objectives. You talk a lot about smartphones. How much of a tailwind are we expecting from 5G? Can you incorporate that into your analysis? 5G absolutely will be a growth driver for next many years to come. 5G is not only about smartphones. 5G is also about machine to machine connectivity that really on the edge is going to bring about many, many devices that will be connected with each other, intelligent devices that are able to collect more data. Within smartphone, no question that 5G phones with their low latency and high speeds are be able to give you access to data and give you rich experiences. So for example, imagine a 360 degree immersive experience that you can watch on your phone, watch different perspectives of a game that's being broadcast to you. That then, in order to manipulate all of that on your smartphone, it needs more memory, it needs more storage. At Mobile World Congress, 12 gigabyte of DRAM smartphones were announced in February mm -hmm. of this year, and a terabyte of storage was announced in the phones as well. And one of the phones that has 5G already is Huawei. How are your relationships with Huawei right now? With respect to the U.S.-China trade relations, with respect to the entity listing of Huawei, we have said publicly that it has impacted our opportunity with Huawei. They are an important and a large customer of Microns. We are very global. We are engaged with well-diversified set of customers with our memory and storage solutions that go into very many different end market opportunities. So our revenues with Huawei, as we said in our earnings call in September, are less than what they would have been if Huawei was not placed on the entity listing. 
And are you actively working with the Trump administration to clarify any confusion about licenses to apply for, how to get around some of the export bans? So we also said in our September earnings call that we have applied for licenses. Of course, licenses have not been granted yet. You will know it you know, when they get granted. And we said that uh, without grant of licenses, it will potentially lessen our opportunities with Huawei in terms of future business with them. But the point is that we are a company with a diversified portfolio and a very broad set of customers all across the globe. And I want to tie that into a chart here that I'm showing in my Bloomberg terminal to our audience, which shows your total revenue. And then, of course, a portion of that, just under half or so, coming from China. So you say that you're a global company. Where else can you start to shift that revenue, given all the headwinds coming from China? Yeah, I think what's important to understand is that we are a global company and a lot of our customers that are based outside of China take delivery of their product in China for their supply chain considerations. So I think the numbers you are looking at are really related also to that aspect. If you look at Chinese headquartered companies, you know, as we have recently reported in our 10K, Chinese headquartered company, our revenue is approximately 20%. And with respect to Huawei, yes, they have been the largest customer on fiscal year 19 that we ended approximately 12%. Um, so, uh, you know, with a well diversified set of customers, these customers may take their supply in China, but we are engaged with them elsewhere as well. Finally, in your business, we know it all comes down to the prices of NAND and DRAM. And if you bear with me, I'm going to show one more chart here for our Bloomberg audience, which is your share price, Micron, rising. But NAND prices have been diverging. We thought we'd see bottoming out NAND and DRAM. What do you see? Are we at the bottom? Do we start to see NAND and DRAM prices start to tick up higher? So we talked about this also recently in our but September earnings call. But we want new news here. Give us yeah, some new news. We, we did say that, you know, NAND has started seeing price increases. That's what we had discussed. And, uh, you know, of course, NAND market, you know, with the price elasticity that it has, you know, more and more of solid state drives are being used in notebook computers. Attach rate is increasing as well as the content is increasing. On the DRAM side, your end market demand drivers continue to be secular in nature, whether it's your data center or it's your smartphone or PC or even in industrial applications, automobiles, etc. you're needing more DRAM. So we had said that, yes, there is some excess supply in the market right now, but what's important is that the supply growth in the industry in DRAM is less than the demand growth, which means this inventory that may be there is now coming down rapidly and therefore it's a matter of time before I believe DRAM will also be in a good place. So, so many thoughts there. Micron CEO Sanjay Mehrotra, thank you for joining me. Thank you. And coming up, we take a look all at the Amazon earnings call. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. And back to our top story, e-commerce giant Amazon missed analyst estimates, posting a profit drop for the first time in two years. So Amazon's forecast for the all-important holiday quarter also gave investors more to worry about. The company projected revenue of $80 billion to $86.5 billion, and that falls short of the average analyst expectation of about $87.1 billion. For more analyst reaction, I bring in Andrew Lipsman of eMarketer from Chicago and Shweta Kajuria of RBC Capital Markets. Shweta, great to have you here. After this, you run to the call. What would be your first question? Yes, thanks for having me. Um, well, if we look at the results for third quarter, there were some really strong points. Revenue came in um, above uh, the high end of their guidance, operating income above the high end of the guidance, which was uh, 15th of the 19 past quarters that they have beat the high end of the guidance. And my first point, uh, on the flip side, it was AWS growth. And if we look at the aftermarket reaction of the stock, it was down the last time I checked about 6 or 7 percent, and primarily because AWS revenue growth decelerated above 
about 2 points to 35 percent year over year versus expectations. The street was at 37 percent, but we think investors were expecting some deceleration. So first question would be where am this will this result of AWS will bring greater focus to the reinvent in December, their la largest AWS conference in Vegas. And so the question was around is their focus greater on the enterprise sales partnerships, which are larger co contracts and could pressure the revenue growth. So Andrew, I pose the same question to you and in doing so I show you a chart here on my Bloomberg terminal which shows the rate of growth of that Amazon uh, web services which as we've said has just continued to climb sequentially now down to about 35 percent. Andrew, is this your biggest concern? Absolutely. I think increasingly as AWS goes, uh, Amazon stock goes, and that's what analysts are looking at. Um, now, looking back to last quarter, that was the first time we saw the growth rate dip to below 40% year over year. Um, and I called it the canary, potential canary in the coal mine. And we've seen a continuation of that trend, um, dipped even further than expected to the mid 30s. Um, so it's really something to uh, be concerning. And then on the other side of things, we saw this really strong top line momentum. Uh, the commerce business is on fire right now. Um, but that's the impact of that is going to be muted by the fact that they're guiding uh, a bit lower for the fourth quarter than analysts were expecting. And that guiding lower for the fourth quarter, is that a broad consumer problem or an Amazon problem? It does not seem to be a consumer um, it doesn't seem to be an Amazon problem, really, because if we look at the retail results from third quarter, um, the retail year-over-year -year growth in North America accelerated to 28% if you exclude Whole Foods. That is the highest we have seen since third quarter of 2017 in two years. So retail results, online sales, uh, online store sales grew 22% versus 16% in the second quarter. That's a six-point acceleration. So retail generally is, is great, and, and we think it it is likely because of the one day prime impact on Amazon's uh, top line. And Andrew, you heard Shweta talk about that investment in the one day or same day delivery. How long do you let that investment go on, assuming they'll gain market share at the expense of profit, or do you start to get nervous about all of those investments in same day delivery? I'm not nervous at all. I think these are really smart, sound investments that you're going to take a hit for a few quarters but it's gonna pay uh, really profound long-term dividends. Um, you're already seeing it. You saw them reference it in Q2 as a growth driver. You've seen that extend into Q3 now, um, and it's positioning them well for Q4. Now, I wanna focus on Q4 for a moment. Um, I, I think it's the consumer spending environment has, has been pretty strong. Amazon is actually positioned to gain market share during that quarter, in large part because of the next day rollout. Um, it's a wonky Q4. We have a shortened holiday season. I don't think people are paying enough attention to the fact that we shrink from a 32-day season last year between Thanksgiving and Christmas to a 26-day season. Um, that squeezes spending. It has nothing to do with whether or not consumers want to spend or have the money to spend. Spending just gets squeezed when they start so late. Um, so Amazon's going to feel that. Everyone else is going to feel it. But I think Amazon actually on a relative basis will do better in Q4 than everyone else. And Shweta, I come and show a terminal chart here again for our audience, which shows Amazon in the last year on a normalized basis has been underperforming the broader retail index. Is that a regulatory overhang or something much more specific that people aren't buying the stock right now? There could be three reasons. One is the regulatory that you called out, the antitrust issue that Amazon's facing. It started in Europe. Now we have the political environment that is a that, that could be pressuring the stock. The second is also operating margins. So the guidance for Q4 operating margins was over 250 basis points deleverage at the midpoint. And that is primarily, uh, likely primarily due to the one day uh, prime impact and the investments that they're making not only in North America, but they are going to expand internationally. So that is also a little bit of an overhang. Um, and the third is AWS growth, which is decelerating. And where can that grow as Amazon, which is by far the largest player right now, continues to partner more with, more with larger enterprise clients. So these three seem to be pressuring the stock. That said, valuation, we think, is very attractive. Very attractive. A Andrew, your take, valuation attractive here? Yeah, I mean, when you see a dip like this, I don't see the long-term concerns outside of AWS, so um, I, I think there definitely is potential to buy the dip here. 
Um, one other bright spot that I really want to focus on is the advertising business. Um, that's becoming more and more important, and like AWS, is extremely high margin. Um, that reaccelerated uh, back from you know the 30% growth rate up to 44%, I believe, this quarter. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of runway ahead of that business. So that's tightly linked to what's happening in commerce. I think those two businesses have a lot of momentum right now that can drive the business going forward as long as AWS doesn't become an increasing drag. Well, you heard it here first, a potential to buy the dip on Amazon. Thank you to Shweta Kajuria of RBC Capital and Andrew Lipsman of eMarketer. Thank you both for joining. Thanks for having. And coming up, Twitter's massive miss. Shares plunge as the so-called product issues weigh on the performance of its advertising business. Our conversation with Twitter CFO Ned Siegel. He's next. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at today's top tech calls. So shares of Tesla surged to close at the highest since 2018 on Thursday after the company posted a surprise profit for the third quarter. That led analysts at Nomura to raise the price target to 300 and Canaccord to raise the price target to 375. Piper Jaffray analyst said it is getting hard to poke holes in the Tesla thesis. Shares of Microsoft rallied on Thursday after first quarter results topped estimates and boosted analyst confidence. A BMO analyst raised the price target to 165 from 160, saying the results support the view that Microsoft is a core holding that has both defensive and offensive attributes. And meanwhile, Bernstein initiated Peloton with an outperform and a $29 price target. The analyst said Peloton is leading the disruptive wave of connected fitness with meaningful opportunities for growth in equipment and subscription revenue. And those are a look at your top tech calls. Now, Twitter shares closed down by the most in five years after reporting quarterly results that fell short of Wall Street's estimates. The company says privacy issues involving its advertising business will continue to have an impact on performance. But daily active users rose 4% from the previous quarter. I spoke with Twitter CFO Ned Siegel. He explained the unexpected miss. I'd start by saying advertiser sentiment continues to be strong. Uh, but we did see more seasonality than we expected in July and August. And we also had a couple product related issues where some settings didn't work as expected, which we realized during the quarter. That impacted us by about three or more points in Q3. And we expect it to have four or more points of impact in Q4. So fixing those settings is good from the consumer, the user's perspective. How is that going to impact your financials, perhaps even more into 2020? Well, we're working hard to remediate these things. And remediation first means communicating clearly so people understand uh, when something didn't go the way we expected it to, to the people who were affected, to our other stakeholders. Uh, there were tweets about this stuff during the, the course of the quarter. Uh, second is to make the setting work the way that uh, we had expected it to. And then we work with partners uh, and we think internally about the best way to make sure that uh, we are giving people as good an experience as possible on Twitter, which means the tweets that they see, the ads that they see, that we're respecting the settings, but uh, finding a way to give them a, a good experience. So uh, an example would be we've got measurement partners who help advertisers understand the success of their campaign. We're working hard to get them better data that respects the user settings, but helps them understand if their campaigns are working as well as they thought. A lot of people said that this was a little bit of one of the first signs that you had broken some trust with customers and that this was an opportunity for regulators to talk to you about data privacy. Have you been in touch with regulators about data privacy and controls over that? Well, we're always in touch with regulators all over the world because it's an important part of us understanding their priorities and it's really important for them to understand the principles that we use to make decisions about what questions we ask people how we display our uh, policies on the service and how they play out in the product that we deliver. 
uh, when we do that, um, we find we can come to uh, better conclusions and we can uh, lay our policies out better for people and they can understand our business better as well. Now that you fixed the privacy controls, what do you tell advertisers about why they should come back to the platform and how they can measure the metrics of how they're impacting the consumer? Well, advertisers never really left the platform. We had $700 million of ad revenue in the, the third quarter and uh, although we grew revenue 9% year over year, we actually had double digit revenue growth in the month of September showing that uh, what we saw in July and August uh, really was seasonal. But we explained to them what happened. We talked to them about what we're doing to remediate. And we helped them understand the use cases that we think Twitter is best for for advertisers, which is if you want to launch a new product or service, Twitter is the place to do it. If you are Warner Brothers and you're launching the Joker uh, and you show the trailer all over the internet, it ends up being seen more on Twitter in the first hour than anywhere else, and sometimes by twice as much. Uh, if you want to connect with what's happening, whether it's the Women's World Cup, the beginning of the college football season, or any other big event where people are learning about it and talking about it on Twitter, this is the place for advertisers to be. Those messages have really resonated with advertisers. They continue to resonate in the third quarter as well. You started out the conversation talking about the monetizable daily active users, and that was a bright spot from the street. A Baird analyst came out and he said that that's a positive sign of ongoing product improvement. Some of those product improvements are like topics and interests. When do we expect that to move out of the testing phase and be more fully rolled out? Well, some of it has moved out already, and other things will move out over time. And we can spend years improving how people see more about topics and events that they care about most on Twitter. One, as they go through onboarding, it's making sure that we surface the right accounts and topics to get them into a timeline quickly that's really relevant to them and where they are and what brought them to Twitter. Uh, two is in the home timeline itself, surfacing the topics and events that they care about over time. Three, in the notifications that we provide them, there's more work for us to do. I just got a notification a couple days ago in my production version of the app that uh, many other people use as well, uh, asking if I wanted to follow the Warriors. Not the account, the Warriors, but the topic, the Warriors. And over time, more and more people ought to have the opportunity to cover topics on, on Twitter as well. As we approach the 2020 election, are you updating your privacy policies? Well, we're always challenging ourselves and our thinking around our policies and how best to enforce our principles on Twitter and to be clear with people uh, how they work. In the United States, we think a lot about 2020, but it's always an election year on Twitter. The election for prime minister in Canada that just happened recently, 600 million people voting a, a few months ago in India. There's always something happening on Twitter, which gives us the opportunity to do a better job helping people trust the information that they see on Twitter, helping them feel safe being a part of the conversation, and really finding what they're looking for while they're there. That was Twitter CFO Ned Siegel. Now for more on the reaction to Twitter's earnings, I want to bring in eMarketers Deborah Aho Williamson. Uh, Deborah, the stock not happy. It's off about 20% in Thursday trading. What is your take on that top line revenue miss? Yeah, bad day for Twitter, for sure. You know, Ned said all the right things, but I think two things are still pretty concerning to me. One of those is uh, the fact that the ad targeting uh, issues they've had uh, over the quarter where they had to make some changes, turn off some targeting is definitely something that they've got to fix. Um, but on the other hand, advertisers really come to these platforms for the ad targeting. And it's a fine line of whether to shut off some things or to keep offering things that advertisers might expect to get. Because if they don't get them on Twitter, they might go somewhere else to get them. So that's one big concern. Another concern I have. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Deborah, <laughs> then do advertisers stay with Twitter given they no longer have that targeted advertising? That's a very good question. And I, I do think other platforms are going to start to uh, face more issues about ad targeting. I mean, we've seen over the past several quarters, uh, Facebook CFO also referring to headwinds related to targeting. Those haven't impacted Facebook's revenues yet, but we see that the, the targeting drumbeat and the issues related to targeting, the regulators that are looking at privacy are all kind of looking at all of these companies saying, okay, where, what, when is enough 
enough enough. And so uh, what Twitter's doing, I think, is admirable. It's definitely taking steps to uh, shut off things that are potentially concerning or damaging. But again, advertisers are going to continue to want that, and they're going to continue to look for it uh, where they can. Well, and Deborah, like you said, Twitter is one of the few companies within tech that had stayed away from antitrust, stayed away from regulators when it came to data privacy. Any hint that this disclosure that they had been abusing some of the customer privacy now brings in the attention of regulators. Yeah, uh, no hint yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does start to draw more attention. Uh, certainly Facebook's been in the limelight for months and months, if not years for now, on that issue. And regulators will definitely want to look at all the platforms for all these issues. And finally, no signs of antitrust when it comes to Twitter, am I right? As far as I know, not yet. Deborah Aho Williamson of eMarketer, thank you for joining me. And some news on the banking front. Now, Citigroup is saying that Jane Frazier will be the firm's consumer banking president. The current consumer banking head, Stephen Byrd, will leave. Frazier's elevation makes her a more likely candidate to someday succeed Chief Executive Officer Michael Corbett and potentially become the first woman to run one of the largest U.S. banks. And still ahead, look who's talking. Why, starting next year, people might be conversing with chat box more than their spouses. That's next. This is Bloomberg. With billions of people across the globe connected by smartphones, tablets, and more, the need for instantaneous customer support is paramount, and companies are looking more and more to AI-powered chatbots to meet that need. In fact, Gartner predicts that by next year, 85% of all such interactions will occur via chatbot. One company looking to leverage AI in that space is Teleperformance. It currently works with 59% of the world's largest companies across 170 markets to provide customer service experiences. And recently, they entered into a partnership with Facebook in Nigeria. Joining me from New York, it is the CEO of Teleperformance, Daniel Julian. Daniel, great to have you. Talk to me about your recent um, uh, partnership with Facebook and how you're helping your businesses provide customer support to those customers. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I don't know if I am going to speak a lot about our recent partnership in Nigeria because it's a, it's a premiere for us in the country. And in fact, uh, it's much more to help to develop the sales than to help uh, to develop the customer service in Africa. Uh, but what is sure is that uh, all the companies all around the world now want to deliver a much better customer service to their customers because the customers have taken the power thanks to internet and the smartphone. And the idea of chatbots is very, very interesting. There was a statistic that we'd be speaking with chatbots more than our spouses. Do you see chatbots becoming more and more of your business? Uh, you know, the first time I heard about the chatbox, something like four, four, five years ago when it came, I was a little bit depressed because uh, my job is to have an army of service, of people helping the customer to solve their problem on the day to day. And I was thinking, my God, all these chatbots, they are going to do the job. And then that was four or five years ago. And guess what? Our company has never grown more than over the last five years. In fact, what's happening is the world is demanding, is more demanding every day. And so, yes, we need the chatbot to help. They are assisting bots that help our customer expert to better serve the customer. I would say the chatbot does a rational part of the job, brings information, but the customer expert, they, they, they manage the empathy, the emotion, because you know, the customer is still a human being. Huh? How are you also using AI and your business in content moderation? In content moderation, I would say typically, AI does and is relevant for 
of the work. But still, AI has a difficulty in contextualizing uh, and in understanding, in making the difference between what is offending, not offending, what is part of reality, what is part of a, a, a story. And so the role of the, uh, of the AI is to, to trim, is to uh, uh, I would say eliminate maybe 95% of the issues. The problem is that there are 5% of the issues that needs to be reviewed by human being. And this human being, by the way, teaching the AI to do a better job. But you know, it's a race that is never going to end. Daniel, critics would say though that chatbots and AI are replacing human jobs. How do you respond? Uh, this is what I wanted to tell you. Uh, today, we employ more than 300,000 people all around the world. And we continue to grow organically, like for like, around 8 to 10% per year. Yes, we, we, we use more AI to deliver a more sophisticated service. But the AI is here much more to assist the individual than to replace the individual. The AI replaces the individual for very simple interactions. And that's a good thing. But each time you come to a complex situation, for example, you take your plane, you miss a plane, you want to find another plane, you want to know what is the price. I mean, if you enter in an AI discussion, I don't know how it's going to finish. Typically, the AI helps us to locate the information and mm -hmm. then to make sure that we are going to reassure you and to make sure that you are going to get your plane. All about the future of AI. That was Daniel Julian, the CEO of Teleperformance. Thank you for joining. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology and Bloomberg Technology's live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.